Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic today is 2016 Year-End Accounting Checklist and Tips. Speaking today will be Erica Bursler and Pam Roja. Erica Bursler is the Manager of Customer Success at Cosmolex, developers of a cloud-based legal billing and trust accounting system specifically designed for solo and small law firms. Erica holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and five years of experience in the legal software industry catering to the specialized technology needs of small to mid-sized law firms. She has given numerous presentations on legal technologies such as law practice technology management, cloud computing, and legal billing and trust accounting compliance. Pam Roja is a management consultant with over 25 years of experience in the legal industry. She was the managing director of a mid-sized law firm in Pennsylvania working with legacy legal specific practice management packages with included accounting. Pam is a certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor for desktop, online, and enterprise editions, as well as Certified Zero Consultant. The Industry Insight webinar series is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. To stay updated on upcoming webinars or view previous videos, visit ambar.org slash industry insight. You can also stay updated on legal technology news through our blog, lawtechnologytoday.org. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar, and we will be sending the video in a follow-up email in a few days. We will also post a video on our blog, which again is lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll now begin the presentation. Great, thank you so much. So let's start out by reviewing what we will be covering today. First off, of course, we do want to have an understanding of what law firm accounting is. Then we're going to go into the year-end legal accounting checklist, what all of that's about and what really needs to be considered when closing out 2016, followed by tips for 2017, how to get off the right foot for the new year, and of course, how can technology help in this overall process. So of course, as the year is ending, um, accounting and bookkeeping has or will soon have everyone's attention. So this is definitely a great time to talk about some tips which will hopefully help you out going forward. But before we get into specific ideas or tips, let's first overview how exactly, um, you know, what exactly we're talking about. What is legal accounting? And um, we will be taking this in a very you know, simple terms, not too advanced, because we do understand that there will be many types of people on the call today. Uh, of course, any questions we'll be taking at the end as well. So law firm accounting does have three components to it. <clears throat> First is the business accounting. This is the back office accounting, facility, payroll, paper, computers. And this is really the type of accounting which is handled by really all businesses. And it's about booking your, your income and expenses to the profit and loss, assets, liabilities, and equity to the balance sheet. That's just straight standard accounting. But there are some other components that are very specific to the legal industry, which are the final two. Um, matter, cost, and income accounting. This is properly posting client costs, cost reimbursements, and also how is the fee income booked to the general ledger. Those methods are very unique to law firms. And the last is fee advances and retainer accounting. So this is uh, dealing with managing client funds being held on account to either pay legal fees or expenses or possibly for disbursements as well. Uh, these could be injury settlements or uh, escrow or anything of that nature. Again, very specific to the legal community. And this area, especially when you're dealing with trust accounting, is when further compliance and regulations come into play. So it's very important to know that when we talk about accounting for law firms, it's not just your business expenses. There's a lot of aspects of it that are unique to the setup of a law firm, and we need to make sure are handled properly. They are also not isolated components. They do all pretty much interact with each other all the time. Um, and this also interacts with billing. Uh, whenever you're you know, paying an invoice or booking costs, posting that to a matter, that integrates very tightly with the billing as well. So we'll talk a lot about today about how that can be a cause of many of the issues uh, when having your accounting and billing separate. There's a lot of challenges involved with that as well. 
but we do want to uh, cover at least at the top level all that legal accounting is comprised of. So now that we understand the overall topic, I am going to pass the presentation to Pam, who will focus, uh, or excuse me, who will walk you through that end of year checklist uh, to assist you in wrapping up your 2016 accounting. And do keep in mind that following the webinar, we will be sending a full length checklist to you to use for your own reference. So don't feel like you need to frantically copy everything down. You will get a copy of your own, but Pam will go ahead um, and talk about the major points within that checklist. Pam? Thank you, Erica. The most neglected accounting task all year long is the most important to complete at year end. Surveys have shown that only 30% of businesses stay up to date on bank reconciliations, and actually a whopping 50% haven't reconciled for six months or more. This would be devastating with IALTA accounts, but that's another topic. If you're one of the 50%, follow this process. Clear your transactions carefully. With so many, there are likely many transactions with the same amount or even with the same name. Be sure to clear the ones that correspond to the monthly statement you're reconciling. Are there transactions in the bank statement that, do, that don't match what's in your books? For example, is check 10026 written to James Smith for $250 in your register, but for $2,500 in the bank statement? Or does your register have the pay as James Smith, but the check is written to cash? The first line of defense to fraud and embezzlement is doing the bank reconciliation. As you complete the process, are there unclear checks that are six months or older? You need to research these. Were they simply entry errors? Is there a vendor that tends to hold checks and then bulk deposit them? Is there an outstanding vendor bill to which the check was supposed to be applied? Then are there uncleared deposits? The same questions apply. Are there entry errors? Did you batch several payments but didn't clear the deposit in your system? Be sure all bank fees are entered and cleared. Since fees are posted by the bank and appear on the statement, it is a common error to forget these, to enter these fees when doing the bank rec. I've received frantic calls from clients who can't balance a statement, having reconciled all transactions, to find that the difference is the fees, and never use an adjustment to enter fees. Always use the expense account on your chart of accounts. Now there are some additional points for reconciling credit card statements. You should enter any finance charges, interest, and late fees. Enter any cash rewards that might be associated with the card. Then you must match your transactions between the credit card statement and your books, and review and confirm that client costs are linked to matters. There are several types of adjustments, but the one I'm questioned about the most is month-end reconciling adjustment. You complete the bank reconciliation, reconciliation and are off. What is a reasonable adjustment? For the IALTA account, there is none. For the operating account, determine with your accounting professional, as there really is no standard. But before making any adjustment, look carefully for transposition errors that your eye may have overlooked, or some of the other issues mentioned above. And a caveat about adjustments. Some software will allow the user to accept an adjustment, no matter how large, so be very careful when using this option. Others require the user to enter a journal entry for the adjustment. Be sure you know how to do this before taking that task on. And always be sure that any adjustments are posted to an expense account on the profit and loss and highlighted for your, accounts, for your accountant's year-end review. The trust account. There are two se separate areas. The client retainer balances. Is the work complete on the matter? Did you bill your time and get paid from the retainer? Frequently, small firms forget to transfer payment for billed time from trust to the firm account. If you have been paid, then you must refund the balance. Year-end is a good time to do this type of cleanup. When was the last transaction? Is the matter dormant, closed, or are you expecting to do more work? And how much is remaining? Some retainer agreements specify a minimum that will not be billed or refunded for example, less than $5. Now, client trust activities need to be examined as well. Are there outstanding transactions to be paid on a matter? Have settlement funds cleared? Have all fees been taken? Were funds held to pay expenses, for example, taxes on a real estate transaction? Have those expenses been paid? And then refund any remaining, uh, any re remaining funds that are in that account. Then you should always run 
a three-way reconciliation report after you've made adjustments and after you've uh, done your reconciliation to ensure that all balances are correct. You must also then print and archive these reports. The next step would be to review your profit and loss. Since most firms report on a cash basis, run the appropriate reports to compare total fee income to paid invoices. Some software have reports such as sales by customer or collection reports. This will help you identify the amount of outstanding receivables, but also any misposted revenue. Reimbursable client costs on the profit and loss will not necessarily equal reimbursed client income. Run the appropriate reports to determine what has not been paid and how long have these expenses aged. Is there a good likelihood that you will be paid? Is it time to write off any expense as a loss? General expense accounts are the basic office ex expenses such as rent and payroll. A review of the, expenses account, uh, the expense accounts should include any mispostings that might belong in reimbursed client costs. It is also a good time to ensure that expenses that have a liability component such as payroll are properly posted and the liability satisfied. Then review your balance sheet. Assets are very important. Did your firm acquire any new assets during the, the year? If so, be sure that they are added to ba the balance sheet with their actual value at the time that they were acquired. Then you must post accrued depreciation according to the IRS schedules. And if you are tracking your advanced client costs on the balance sheet, review the transactions for accuracy and check for any unrecoverable expenses so that you may write them off. As you take a look at liabilities, first take a look at your long-term liabilities. When were they opened? Do the payments reflect the debt service agreement? And are payments being allocated to the correct debt? And be sure that you are splitting the actual principal balance and posting it to the liability, and your interest should be posted to interest expense on your profit and loss. For sh any short-term liabilities, when were they opened? Do the payments reflect the debt service agreement? And for a line of credit, are you required to have a no balance for 30 days? And if so, did you? As we look at equity, we want to note how the, our partner's owner draws allocated. You need to review these to ensure that appropriate owner expenses are allocated to this account. Check with your accounting professional that legitimate firm expenses have not been allocated as owner's draw. You should check your accounts receivable as of the year end, that is December 31st. Some accounting software provide the option to charge, change the balance sheet to accrual so you can run an AR report while others have a designated report for accounts receivable. You should look for invoices aged more than 60 days. And you should create dunning letters or other notification to clients who have very well aged or past due receivables. The client retainer balances as of December 31st again must be reviewed to see if there are any open invoices. Pay any open invoices first. Move the funds from the trust account into your operating account. Then review are all the matters that you've listed, are they still active? And if not, formulate a plan to issue refunds. The 1099 miscellaneous for non-employee compensation is for anything that is in excess of $600. You must run a vendor report, look, look for expert witnesses and independent contractors, then contact any that you don't already have their social security number or EIN number so that you can prepare a Form 1099 miscellaneous for each of these vendors as well as the Form 1096 compilation that is required to be filed with the IRS. Finally, there are several accountant activities that your accountant will do after you've made all these adjustments and corrections. They will run a trial balance report and from that trial balance report they will evaluate and assess and then make any adjustments. If your software doesn't automatically move net income, the accountant must move income and expense summary, which is usually appears on the balance sheet, to net or net income 
to the balance sheet by a journal entry, and that journal entry should be dated January 1st. They move the income and expense summary or net income to either retained earnings or owner's equity. Then you should ensure that your net income on your profit and loss and your balance sheet match. You close your books effective December 31st to avoid any accidental edits or changes to the books for, for last year that will then impact the new year. And now I'll turn it back to Erica. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. So now that you know what needs to be done for to close up really 2016, I will provide five tips for setting your books right for 2017. And to give you a visual aid, I will also wrap up with a brief uh, overview with uh, the Cosmic software to highlight these various points, just to give a little bit of a, vis a visual. So the first tip uh, that we have for 2017 is be sure to use a legal specific chart of accounts. Now, the chart of accounts is the foundation of double entry bookkeeping. Each and every financial transaction will impact two chart of accounts. One will be debited, the other will be credited. Uh, now, law firm accounting has very specific needs, very unique needs when it comes to these types of accounts. So the accounting system that you use should be customized to have a unique set of chart of accounts. And here we'll be showing what those, an example of what those legal specific journal ledger accounts are. All right, so here you have everything from uh, trust funds, retainer accounts, advanced or reimbursable client costs, fee income. Those things are unique to law firms, would not be in your standard chart of account list in a general accounting software. So it's important to know what all of these are. Now, besides having this list, it's also um, making sure that the expenses or the income are posted properly to these accounts. So once those entries are made, how are you ensuring that they're being posted to the right account? You may have somebody making a, um, an invoice payment who might have no accounting experience. How do they know where to post that to or who makes those types of decisions? And how do you enforce that, hey, this is the way this should be posted, make sure that happens from now on. If the staff needs to remember which chart of account to use each and every time, that's really a recipe for mistakes. That's when a lot of um, inconsistencies will happen and then a lot of adjustments will need to be made at end of year and there'll be quite a mess for the accountant to sort out as well. Now, of course, a legal specific accounting system will provide these types of chart of accounts out of the box and some settings and whatnot to enforce correct use. A general purpose accounting system will need to be customized and that correct use will need to be remembered. So it's something just to keep in mind the difference between legal specific and more of a general accounting software. The second tip of course has to do with IELTS accounting. Of course there is a lot of due diligence required uh, to be compliant within IELTS accounting guidelines and whatnot. Proper bookkeeping is needed not only for smooth reporting at the end of the year, but we all know that there are consequences which can come about if your books are poorly held, uh, especially since you're dealing with those client funds. And Pam brought up a good point that it's absolutely necessary to do that monthly reconciliation to make sure you have those clean and accurate books all the time. And good things to keep in mind that should never occur in your trust account is you should never have commingling of your funds whatsoever. And commingling could be of two types. It could be um, <clears throat> either commingling of your own personal funds in the trust account. If something is earned, it should be taken out of the trust account. Um, some states allow a bit of a buffer for bank fees and whatnot, but again, that is state mandated, so make sure to check the guidelines of your state. But another way of commingling is overdrafting on a ledger. If a particular client, you have $2,000 of their funds and you cut a $3,000 check, you're technically taking $1,000 from another client. So it's very important to know that having those aspects in mind, if you're able to have a software that has safeguards built in to prevent those measures, that's even better. But you need to be aware that it could very easily happen just by negligence, like just not looking at the, at the balance. You can easily overdraft, commingle, and that will have to be explained at the end of the day. I did mention before how important reconciliations are, but even more so is that three-way reconciliation. Being able to have that three-way check 
which is the bank balance, the book balance, and all the individual client ledgers, that is like the ultimate check. In some states, it is absolutely required to have it. I recommend it really for everybody because there's no harm in having that type of report. It gives the right information to anybody who may be auditing your account or asking any questions. It's that three-way check to say, hey, I'm doing my job, everything matches, I am good to go. And again, as I mentioned, typically a legal, a legal specific solution should provide support for IOLTA compliance, uh, really out of the box, because of course we understand that general accounting softwares don't handle trust accounting on a regular basis, so it's understandable that they may not have those safeguards in place, but if you're looking at a legal specific solution, they definitely should have those safeguards built in. Now from an accounting standpoint, um, it is very important that trust funds are recorded properly. They are a liability to the firm, and they belong on the balance sheet. And these can be retainers, maybe that are not yet earned, or maybe they're funds that have been entrusted to you that will eventually be dispersed to other parties. Only when those amounts or those funds are earned should they be moved out of trust, which is the liability, to the operating account, which would then be income. Only at that point, you shouldn't be booking trust retainers to income or any other type of account. So it's important to understand that when you're holding those clients on behalf, uh, those funds on behalf of the client, they should be maintained as a liability. Our third tip here is full coverage of client costs. So this is referring to paying client expenses out of the po out of pocket and then seeking reimbursement for those. And there are three issues that do surround um, this whole process. And again, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, this is specific to law firms, something that is very important in terms of um, making sure that income doesn't just slip right out of your pocket just because we forgot to seek reimbursement for something, but it's also very common to pay those expenses out of pocket and later seek reimbursement. So you wanna make sure they're handled in the right way. And the first issue is income leakage that can happen. So it's not uncommon for matter expenses to be paid from maybe an accounting software or by credit cards, and then they're failed to be posted to the matter in whatever billing software you may be using. It's actually very common to be forgotten, unfortunately. And since most practice management softwares include invoicing clients for time and costs, those costs are not captured and then that results in that leakage, that income that will never be reimbursed because the client was never billed for it. So you want to try to have a method where everything comes full cycle, is connected, is um, maybe all in one solution where those items are not forgotten, they're always um, in that billing cycle and carried over to that invoice. Also accounting issues. Um, I did mention with the legal specific chart of accounts that also relates to client costs. When posting client costs, you do have um, a couple of options. Many of you may post costs as advanced client costs, which is a balance sheet account, while others may post to reimbursable client costs, which is an expense account, which is on the profit and loss. Some of you may use both, depending on the type of work that you do. But whatever your choice is, that is between you and, account and your accountant, that's an accounting decision to sort out how you want your costs posted, but whatever that choice may be, ensure that whatever system you use can support it and that it's something that's you know remembered, it's kind of a set it and forget it mentality that you can set that um, setting and not have to remember each and every time you're posting your client cost as to how it should be posted. And if there's inconsistencies, if you're posting you know, advanced here, reimbursable here, and the same type of matter, same type of cost, and you're just posting them all differently, that's going to lead to a lot of inconsistencies which will drastically affect your balance sheet and your profit and loss because they're posted differently. So you want to make sure to have some consistency there. And that includes non-reimbursable client costs as well. Even those items that are not being reimbursed by the client, they still need to be posted correctly. Uh, you st it's still an expense. It's still an expense that you're recording. You're just stating that you're not seeking reimbursement for it. So that needs to be recorded in a separate um, general ledger account as well. The last item here is in regards to indirect costs. So very often um, the biggest leakage of income can be with those indirect costs. And what I mean by that is business expenses or overhead costs, I guess you could call it, that has already been paid. Maybe it's some 
uh, legal subscriptions like for research or printer supplies or copies or something of that nature that never gets passed down in any way, shape, or form to the client. And a lot of them can be passed down, and they can be passed down as indirect costs. So once those are, are captured, you also want to make sure that they're recorded properly as a reimbursable client costs, and that is actually an indirect account. It's a soft cost account. So those are the three main items that come up, or the challenges, I should say, that come up when needing to properly handle client cost recovery. Tip number four, this is allocating revenue receipts. Now, as invoices get paid, whether it's fully or partially, how is that income booked? An invoice can have some costs, some fees, some finance charge, late fee discount, and not all of this is fee income. There's only a portion of that that may be fee income. So due to uh, the complexities in the accounting systems that are not designed for attorneys, lawyers often either ignore allocation or don't really know how to handle it. And there's actually a preferred method of, for legal accounting specifically, of how those payments should be posted. And this is the exact order. Let's say you have an invoice that is partially paid, for example, $1,000 invoice, you receive $500. What does that $500 go towards? Does it go towards the fee, the cost, the late fees, the finance charges? What what is the guideline to follow? And this is exactly it. So it needs to go towards sales tax first, if applicable, advanced client costs, which is that balance sheet item, then your direct costs, your indirect costs, finance charges, et cetera, and lastly, fee income. So you could have a partial paid invoice where you earned no fee. Why is that important to know? Well, in general accounting software, usually it's a proportional uh, allocation. They'll take that $500 and apply it proportionally to each one of these items. The issue there is you're technically claiming more fee income than what was actually earned. So in the case of, let's say, fee allocation for um, different parties on a matter, let's say you're doing some reporting as to who brought in what money for that particular month. Well, you want an accurate statement of that. If fee income was not yet earned on a partially paid invoice, then that person shouldn't be compensated for the fee income earned. So it's having this um, order in mind, and also keep in mind that not all accounting softwares follow these guidelines because they're not legal specific, but it's important to know it yourself. And then, of course, the final tip is eliminate any sources of duplicate data entries. Law practice management and business accounting are often in two separate systems, and they work together on many different points daily, um, when you're paying invoices, when you're posting matter costs. So that's a lot of different data entry in two different types of systems. So that could lead to keying errors, uh, and of course, finding those could be really, really difficult. Um, but also, you may have inaccuracies, because it, you have the not only typing the wrong number, but maybe you're looking at a different matter in each system, or the time that's invested in making all these different type of entries. You also may be using exports, imports, or sinks between accounting and practice management systems, and those very often are unstable or don't always work properly. They may be one directional. All those types of things you need to keep in mind because at the end of the day, it's all about having the most accurate information, but you also don't want to spend tons and tons of time on these administrative activities that would, you know, you're not billing your client for. You want to be able to work on your client's files, uh, service them on their cases, and not have to worry so much about making all of these duplicate data entries at the end of the day. And this is kind of just a visual of what I was talking about, um, how you usually have a gap between the billing and practice management and the accounting. Typically in two separate systems, uh, maybe even two separate people doing the activities, but they very much interact. But there's usually this big gap of how do we get the information in one system to match the information in another. Usually done by a lot of double data entry, a lot of reconciling, double checking, or nothing matches and they're just really messy books and that's an even bigger problem. So to bridge that gap, very often the solution is to have an all-in-one 
law firm accounting system uh, that would have your billing, your accounting, your practice management all in one, that would definitely close that gap. Now, I do want to give a quick walkthrough of the few items that I showed, uh, just to give you a visual of everything that I'm talking about from an accounting standpoint. So in regards to the first item we mentioned, which was legal accounting customization, that's that chart of accounts, making sure that it's specific for law firms, because that is, at the end of the day, the business that you are running. So here in the accounting area, I have my chart of accounts tab. These are all the chart of accounts that are available in the program, and you'll see I have those legal specific type of items like advanced client costs, I have trust funds, I have a fee income, I've even created sub accounts for my fee income account. All of this is legal specific, so not only do you need to make sure it's in the system, here it's already given to you, so you don't have to worry about what items do I need, what is missing, what needs to be replaced. Now we did talk about how it's not just about how, you know, what's available in the system, but how they're posted. Well, there's a lot of different areas in the program where we default these types of choices for you. For instance, if I go, and we'll talk a little bit now about trust accounting, is if I go to a trust account, let's say I have this particular matter here that has some funds in trust accounting, let's say I'm going to go ahead and do a deposit. Right away there's an account field. <clears throat> no matter what this is, a deposit, a check, an adjustment, it's going to affect my liability account. I don't have to select anything here, but even if I do, I have very limited choices. We're only able to do that because we're legal specific and the trust, the business accounting, the billing is all together in one application. So we're able to make a lot of um, defaults for you and make sure that those are selected properly so that decision does not have to be made. Now, what is this preventing? Well, two things. One, I don't have to do a double data entry because I'm making an accounting entry and a trust accounting deposit in one step. And two, that person who's making that trust deposit doesn't have to know what that entry is, doesn't have to know what to, to enter, and doesn't have to tell somebody to, hey, go into the accounting system and make this entry. That whole part is taken out of the equation. Now, one thing that's important to note, especially about the trust accounting, is that notice on this page I have those client trust funds here in that last column. So I'm always aware as to what the balance is for a particular matter. That's very important when having your book set up for your trust accounting. You need to make sure, I can't tell you, I've actually had people tell me I don't know who whose money is whose in my trust account, and that's a big problem. You don't want to run that risk. So having a type of program that allows you to have these trust ledgers and see exactly what's available for these particular matters is very important. Also being able to do your disbursements and your reconciliations, especially the monthly reconciliation and that three-way reconciliation report. All of that trust accounting, of course, is fully built into our system, so you're able to run those types of reports directly from here and not worry too much about how am I going to you know, create this report, uh, what information do I need. It's really all built in the software as an all-in-one solution. Now, we did talk a little bit about client cost recovery as well. I mentioned uh, how you may pay those out-of-pocket costs and forget to uh, link them to the matter. Well here, because the accounting and billing is all together, I would post this as a hard cost. In a hard cost window, and what really makes it a little bit different, is at the very top is my transaction. This is that out-of-pocket expense. So let's say it was a $50 filing fee that I was going ahead and paying at the courthouse. This is the transaction. So this is typically what would be entered in the accounting software, uh, whatever that accounting software may be. Now at the bottom here though, in the same step, in the same system, even in the same window, I'm making that expense card entry. So it will not be forgotten. I actually cannot save this screen without completing the expense card. So I'll say, okay, this is for a filing fee, so that my billing part is captured. There's a third thing that's captured here. That's the account. Again, I mentioned anytime there's a transaction, a general ledger entry needs to be made, and we're making that for you. There are settings in order to decide what choices are here, but once you make that decision, it's defaulted for you. Nobody needs to remember what goes where. So essentially three different steps, 
my out-of-pocket expense, posting it to the matter so it'll be invoiced, and making entry on the general ledger all happens in this one step. So not only, of course, is that convenient, but the less times you have to keep typing the same information, the lower the risk of errors is with all of that. And the fourth item we talked about is in regards to revenue receipts. So when you receive a payment on an invoice, how is that allocated? Well, many attorneys, if you're using programs maybe such as QuickBooks and using a different billing software or a different practice management software somewhere, you receive the payment on the invoice, but then need to make those individual entries on the journal ledger as to what that payment is. From a billing standpoint, you only care how much money was received, is that invoice paid, but from a accounting standpoint, how is that payment being allocated? So I'm just going to quickly show you a paid invoice and how that was allocated. Now in our system, all you have to do is generate the invoice and apply a payment. This is what was on the invoice, so I had some legal fees, some costs, some late fees, discounts, overhead, etc., and I applied a payment. Down here is my accounts. These entries were made for me. These are the allocations on the general ledger. These are the various entries. Now, the program knows which entries to make, either based on how you posted it, like is it a hard, soft, a hard cost, a soft cost, is this a, a unique fee income situation, or based off of what it is. Discounts on the invoice will be posted as discounts. Late fees will be, um, will be entered as other business income. So we're able to make all of these um, allocations in literally an automated fashion in the background, so there's no, uh, no need to worry about any of that. And of course, the double data entry overall through all these examples is completely eliminated because everything is happening in the same system. In fact, you're able to multitask in certain windows to make sure the accounting, the billing, the trust accounting is all getting covered at the same time. And the last is, of course, the report. So in addition to the trust accounting report I mentioned, you need to be able to, in any accounting software, generate your profit and loss, your balance sheet, your general ledger reports. All of these are essential for running your business, knowing what your assets, liabilities, and equity are, what's the income and expense for the year, and especially what Pam was talking about, those end-of-year reports, they need to all be able to be generated quite easily and in real time. You want to be able to, let's say it's um, January 1st, you want to run your, your reports up to December 31st. I could do that directly from the system. I don't have to wait for my accountant to come in. I don't have to wait for the accounting software to be updated. Everything's here all in one tool and ready to be generated. All right, so just to kind of summarize a little bit, um, today's focus, of course, was on accounting. You know how to wrap up your 2016 and start off 2017 on the right foot. This is what Cosmox has to offer. So in addition to the billing, as I mentioned, and practice management, we bridge that gap by having that fully integrated business accounting and also trust accounting. 